Okay, we are on to another chemistry topic. This one is models of atoms. So what do atoms look like? And how has the model of the atom changed over time? Remember, the first discussion of atoms came from the ancient Greeks, but the atomic theory officially was not developed until much later. But it began that long ago. So let's get to it. All right, here are the objectives, pause and peruse. All right, atomic theory. All matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms. The idea is more than 2,000 years old. Again, back to the ancient Greeks. But the seeing of the evidence of atoms, that's much more recent. The image on the right that you see right here on this slide is a much more accurate representation of what an atom truly looks like based on our current understanding. Okay, there are three laws. Remember, a law just says how it is, right? No explanation, just a description. There are three laws that support the existence of atoms. So let's go over them. Okay, the law of definite proportions. Remember, definite means that's the way it is. So again, supports the atomic theory. What does it mean? A chemical always contains the same elements in exactly the same proportions by weight or mass. So if a compound is... 20% hydrogen and 80% nitrogen, it is always that ratio, 100% of the time. So every molecule of a substance is made of the same number and types of atoms. So water is H2O. So a molecule of water always has two hydrogen and one oxygen, no matter which water molecule you look at, always the same. Okay, the law of conservation of mass. It again supports the atomic theory. Mass cannot be created or destroyed in ordinary chemical and physical changes. The mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products 100% of the time. It's a law. It's just the way it is. Now the law of multiple proportions. So we had definite proportions before, but now multiple proportions. It still supports the atomic theory, but what it says is when two elements combine to form two or more compounds. So you can see this example, we have nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. So it's nitrogen and oxygen, but two different compounds. The mass of one element that combines with a given um, mass of another element, it's in the ratio of whole numbers. So nitrogen monoxide is one nitrogen to one oxygen. Nitrogen dioxide is one nitrogen to two oxygen. It's not in halves, okay, it's not in three quarters, it's not in some weird decimal. Atoms combine in whole number ratios, okay? So hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, but water is H2O. They both contain hydrogen and oxygen, just in different proportions, hence multiple proportions. Okay, so here is a, an image and the question is, what law supports this laboratory observation? So it says the mass of A, which is the wood and air, is equal to the mass of B, which is the um, carbon plus carbon dioxide plus water. So what law is that? That's the law of conservation of mass, right? The mass of the reactants equals the mass of the products. What law supports this observation? So let's look at it. So I have one gram of hydrogen and eight grams of oxygen. That gives me nine grams of water. If I have one gram of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen, that gives me 17 grams of hydrogen peroxide. Law of multiple proportions, right? I can have the same two elements combined in different whole number ratios to form different compounds. And then what law supports this observation? So if I have four atoms of lead and four atoms of sulfur, I get four of lead sulfide. But if I have six atoms of sulfur instead, I still only get four of lead sulfide, I just have some extra sulfur. Or in the last case, I have some extra um, lead. So this is the law of definite proportions. So for lead sulfide, it is always one lead, one sulfur combining. So if I don't have enough sulfur left, I don't get any more lead sulfide. 
if I don't have any more lead yet left, I don't get any more lead sulfide. The proportion is always the same. Okay, so Dalton's atomic theory. So 1808, John Dalton came up with an atomic theory, five principles. One, all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms, which cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. Now, later we found that part to be not true, but let's just go with it. Atoms of a given element are identical in their physical and chemical properties. Again, this one, we found some glitches here. Atoms of different elements differ in their physical and chemical properties. Atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. In chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged, but are never created, destroyed, or changed. Okay, so there were some issues discovered later, but this is a great foundation coming from Dalton. And based on those five principles, this is the model of an atom that uh, Dalton proposed. It's a solid sphere, a bowling ball model. Atoms were just little small circles. Now, subatomic particles. Atoms can, in fact, be broken into pieces. This led to changes in Dalton's atomic theory. The three subatomic particles that are most important that we will focus on primarily in this course, proton, neutron, electron. There are other subatomic particles, so just for reference, there are many. So quarks make up protons and neutrons. A positron, which we will talk about when we do nuclear chemistry, but it's the opposite of an electron. So same mass, opposite charge. And then a neutrino, it's similar to an electron, but no charge. All right, how did we get changes to the atomic theory? Well, with experiments. So let's talk about one, the cathode ray experiment. And the name associated with this experiment is J.J. Thompson. And J.J. Thompson discovered the electron with this experiment. So what was the setup? Take a glass tube, pump most of the um, air out of it. One end, the anode, which was um, attached to the positive voltage terminal. The other cathode attached to the negative voltage terminal. You don't need to remember that necessarily, just that it had an anode and a cathode. And what he did was observe the cathode rays. A glowing beam came out of the cathode, struck the anode and the nearby glass walls. Cathode ray tubes are still used today. They're used in TVs, they're used in monitors, and used in radar displays. Okay, so what were the conclusions of the cathode ray experiments? You can see right in that um, GIF, you can see um, a hand moving closer. What's in the hand is a magnet. And when you move it close to the cathode ray, it moves. So this led to some very interesting conclusions. So the cathode ray is a negative charge. So it came from the cathode and it moved in response to electric and magnetic fields. So it was negative. Also, it was made of particles. So you can see in that image that there was a little paddle wheel put inside the tube in the path of the cathode ray. What happened is literally that paddle wheel moved. So whatever was in that cathode ray had to have enough mass to be able to move that wheel. All right, so the cathode ray experiment led to the discovery of the electron. The cathode rays have particles that have mass. They can turn the wheel and a negative charge. Remember, they move in response to electric and magnetic fields. These particles are called electrons. They're subatomic particles with a negative charge. But that's not even the whole story. It was known that atoms were neutral. They have no charge. So if atoms had these negative pieces, they must also have positive charges to balance the negative electrons. What was discovered in the cathode ray experiment? Electrons with a negative charge and mass. Thompson's model was the plum pudding model or the cookie dough model. So it was a ball of positive with these negative charges stuck in it. Next experiment, gold foil experiment. Okay, so this was Ernest Rutherford, which led to the discovery of the nucleus. So the setup of the experiment, use a beam of small positively charged particles called alpha particles, and the beam was directed at a thin gold foil. Here's what Rutherford expected. Shine a beam of particles at gold foil, they will bounce back. 
but holy, that was not what happened. Rutherford observed the angles the particles were deflected, but what happened was most of the particles literally went through. So imagine you just ran at a wall and ended up on the other side. Whoa, sort of like really, or Rutherford struggled with this at first. Why, why did this happen? But not all the particles did go through. Some were deflected and some were deflected backward, like at really strange angles. So what were the conclusions? Most of the atom is empty space. Otherwise, why would the particles go through? The atoms contained a concentrated positive charge in a tiny space. So there was the mass of an atom in a tiny little space and it had to be positive because the alpha particles were positive. So when the alpha particles bounced into that um, central positive mass, they bounced back. Okay, they weren't attracted to it. They were reflected away from it. And the mass of that positive charge region has to be larger than the mass of the alpha particle. Remember, Rutherford was using gold foil, so we're talking about gold atoms. And so remember, the alpha particles were deflected. So um, the mass of whatever was in the center there was large enough to deflect. Okay, so what was the importance of the discovery? Okay, so the nucleus is in the center of an atom. It has the mass, or nearly all the mass, of an atom in the nucleus. It has very little volume, takes up very little space of the atom. And it has a positive charge from particles called protons. And it is surrounded by negative electrons, and that gives it all the space. So tiny little nucleus in the center, big space where all the electrons are. So here's Rutherford's model. So this model, though, we should note, can't explain why electrons didn't simply just crash into the nucleus, okay? But we have a central, very small nucleus, and then a big space where the electrons can orbit around the nucleus. What was discovered in the gold foil experiment? So what did Rutherford discover with this experiment? Well, an atom is mostly empty space. And there is a nucleus in an atom with a positive charge, very small, takes up very little of the volume of the atom, but most of the mass. What about neutrons? Okay, remember in the beginning I said protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, the charge of an atom explained protons and electrons. Perfect. But the mass of an atom was not explained by it. Something was missing. So. The electrons had very little mass. The protons had mass. When you added them together, they didn't equal the mass of the atom. So obviously something was missing. So Irene Juliet Curie um, discovered that when alpha particles hit an atom of beryllium, a beam that could go through almost anything was produced. That was expanded on by James Chadwick, and that beam that was not deflected, that beam was not deflected by electric or magnetic fields, which means it didn't have a charge. Hence, neutrons. So is the discovery of neutral particles, neutrons, present in the nucleus. So Bohr's model. Electrons can be certain distances from the nucleus. Each distance corresponds to a certain quantity of energy. Closer to the nucleus, less energy. As you get further and further away, more energy. Um, so again, closer to the nucleus, lower energy levels. Further away from the nucleus, higher energy levels. The difference in energy between two energy levels is called a quantum of energy, an amount, a specific. So I go from energy level three to energy level two, that's a specific amount of energy. The modern model of the atom is called the quantum model or quantum mechanical model. So it includes particle and wave properties of electrons. Electrons are in orbitals. So what are orbitals? Well, they're regions around the nucleus and they're like shapes that correspond to specific energy levels. They're regions where electrons are likely to be found. They're called electron clouds. So they don't have sharp boundaries. So you know when you look at clouds in the sky, the ed edges are kind of fuzzy. Orbitals or electron clouds are the same. Electrons can be in other places, so the orbital has a fuzzy boundary. So maybe the electrons there, maybe not. The interesting thing about this is we have um, 
a high probability of finding an electron in an orbital, but no guarantee. That's why the edges are fuzzy. Modern model of the atom, again, fuzzy edges, the quantum model or quantum mechanical model. The model of the atom has changed over time. Why? Pause it if you want to think about it. As new properties of atoms were discovered, models had to be revised to account for those properties. Why do scientists need models as opposed to directly observing electrons? So why can't we just be like, hey, let me check out some electrons? There is no technology that allows us to literally see an electron. What would cause scientists to change the current model of the atom? So we have the quantum mechanical model or the quantum model. What would make us change that model? So think about all the things that made us change it along the way. Well, new data, right? New experiments came up with something new. And the new data couldn't be explained within the confines of that model. So the new model would have to explain the new data and all the earlier observations and change it in such a way that it would fit. So there we have it, an overview of various models of the atom and how the model of the atom has changed over time. So I hope you learned something new today.